Arahato Sama Sambo Dasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambo Dasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambo Dasa Budang Dhamang Sanghang Namasang Hello everyone Welcome to another Wednesday evening with Clear Mountain Community. And this evening, we'll be continuing our discussion of dependent origin, uh, as it is featured in Chapter 4 of P.A. Paiuto's Buddha Dhamma, the book. And this evening, uh, as we usually do on Wednesdays, we'll start off with a very brief meditation, which will then lead into... Um, reflections on this theme of dependent origination um, for about 25 minutes or half an hour, and then we'll go to questions. So anyone who has any thoughts or questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat box either on Facebook or in the YouTube chat boxes. So uh, without, we can just begin to sit and have a bit of guidance leading us straight into our discussion. So allowing the body to be upright and relaxed. And you can do this sitting on the ground, sitting with a cushion, sitting in a chair, even standing up, but just embodying the virtues of uprightness, as you allow the spine to lift and elongate, and tranquility, relaxation, as you let all the ligaments and sinews and muscles of the body just to fall and drape over the skeleton. Now, see if you can make your mind big. This mean just see if you can fully inhabit your body. See if you can feel the full length, the full breadth, full width of your body, three-dimensionally, from the top of the head to the soles of the feet, from one's back to one's front, from the left side to the right side, full body. And if you're able to do this, then see if you can establish a place of rest and balance here. So an embodiment which is neither tipping in the direction of one's likes and trying to go for and experience more of the pleasant or pushing away the unpleasant but just equanimous, knowing the full body. And if it seems like you can't experience the full body, just make the mind, allow the mind to just be as big and as wide and as vast within the body as you can. And this is our resting spot. A balanced and clear and unbiased resting spot. The mind will shrink either one's felt sense of the body. So you go one second from feeling this whole vastness. And then it seems you're just paying attention to the little tension between your eyes or the feeling in your hands. And when you realize that, you can just go big again. Or you might realize one moment you are feeling the body from the inside, full body, 
big mind. And then the next moment you're off thinking about something else. Or just lulling off. And with that, when you realize it, you can just go big again. Allow the mind to take in the full scope and vastness of this, what we call the interoceptive sense, the felt feeling of the body from the inside. And we'll transition here to our formal reflections, but really it doesn't have to be a, a hard transition. Uh, you can take this full body awareness throughout the day. You can take this as your ground. And really, uh, in our examination of dependent origination, I'll try to make a point this evening that really, when one comes from this place of a, a fully embodied, fully present, uh, big mind, then it is really putting us in a very good spot for observing where in this link of dependent origination we go off and basically start causing suffering for ourselves. So, in other words, when our mind is big like this, feeling the whole body, top of the head to the soles of the feet, then we can see the two main, uh, I guess you could call them kind of veering off points in the normal elaboration of lengths of dependent origination, and that those two are at the point of ignorance and the point of feeling. Yeah, so um, if we allow the mind to be big, then that awareness, that big awareness, is in a sense that is uh, a knowing. We are knowing, we're cognizing this full body, and that is a... Um, a movement away from ignorance. So that first link of dependent origination, by keeping the mind big in this way, we're circumventing the first link, ignorance. And when we keep the mind big in this way, then we don't need to uh, be compelled by the uh, normal grind of sankharas that we generate on a, a coarse level. And consciousness is... Uh, held in a different way. Uh, the mind and body, the six senses, uh, are all coming from a different place than if we are coming from a place of ignorance or compulsion or obsession. And similarly, when we keep this big mind, this fully uh, embodied and spacious mind, and at the same time stay balanced, so aware and balanced, full body aware, but not tipping towards that which we like and tipping away from that which we dislike. When we do that, we are circumventing that next step in dependent origination. That is, uh, we are not moving from feeling to craving. We're just feeling the whole body as it is. And when we keep the mind big and don't then grasp and tilt and bend and lean into all of our, the totally human, but very animalistic urge and drive and instinct to go after that which we like and to move away from and to push away that which we, we dislike, that which is painful. So this can be a very simple way of uh, comprehending under, both understanding the path and practicing the path. This is where the uh, pariyati, or the theory, the study of Buddhism, uh, the, that which is the philosophy of Buddhism, the uh, dependent origination. This is where the hub, the axis, where it touches patipada or patipat, that which is practice. This is where uh, philosophy meets practice, where orthodoxy meets orthopraxy, that is where philosophy meets um, yeah, what we do with that, where dependent origination meets the Four Noble Truths. Uh, when we keep the mind big and abandon the inclination to move towards craving, 
uh, that is the fourth noble truth that's developing the path and abandoning uh, the craving of the second noble truth. So um, to maintain this big awareness, uh, there are three, or actually let's say four similes, which can be quite helpful. And you can practice all of these right now. Um, so we'll move from the smallest to the largest of these similes. So the first simile comes from Ajahn Jeff, and he may have got it, Ajahn Tanisro. He may have gotten it from a Thai source. Um, I'm not sure, but uh, it's an image of a spider in their web. So a spider, especially, say, if you go out in the morning time in the, into a forest and there's a very fine dew that's coating all the grass. Sometimes you can see these very elaborate and large spider webs, uh, which are very uh, finely woven, finely sewn. And inside of this very fine web, there's a spider. And the spider is sensitive to that whole web. Uh, spider knows if anything touches the web, whether it's um, say something which wants to attack them or whether it's food or prey, uh, they are situated in one part of the web, say a corner of the web, but they feel the whole web. And so this is uh, analogous to our awareness of the whole body. When you practice more with this whole body awareness, you realize that actually you can place the mind so the spider can be anywhere in the body, yeah, or nowhere. You actually can just feel the whole body from the soles of the feet to the top of the head, from the back to the front, from the left to the right. You can feel that whole web, this whole interoceptive inner sense of the body um, from anywhere or from nowhere. But if you did, um, you can experiment with feeling this embodiedness from different spots. So. Uh, a couple spots just which uh, are regularly mentioned in texts and by practitioners are the heart chakra or the heart center, basically, uh, just right up in the middle of the chest where the uh, heart organ is, but in the center. And you can feel the whole body from that spot as if you're the, the spider knowing this whole, this whole web of the body or the what's called the dantian or a place which is about uh, two inches behind the navel, two inches below that, so uh, the center uh, beneath the navel. And you can know the whole body from that space. So that's the spider knowing the web. And when something comes in contact with that web, say it's a, a fly they need to eat, then a fly, say, gets coming caught in the web, and then the spider most of the time it's just waiting, you know, just feeling the whole web. And that's where we can rest most of the time, hopefully, just knowing the whole body. But then say a strong feeling comes up, uh, then we can pay attention to it. Um, say for instance, it often happens that this space between the eyes or in the eyebrows will start tensing up for whatever reason, for whatever habit reasons and um, habits of thought and habits of mind. And this spider of the mind, once it realizes it's felt the reverberations, the uh, motion, the movement, that something is awry, something is not balanced, this, uh, there's some tension uh, growing in, say, the forehead region, just for example, uh, then one can relax that. Yeah, one can pay attention to it. And similarly, this say, spider or this uh, centered knowing of the whole body can deal with any physical tension or physical strain that might arise. Okay, knowing it, okay, there's tension in the shoulders, there's tension in the hands, just relax. And similarly with mental tension, one can relax and uh, just address that. And yeah, so just as the spider goes out and deals with whatever touches the, the web. We can do that with our, our mind and our heart. So the next simile is in relation to 
um, say, a mother uh, waving or fanning away flies from their baby child. Yeah. So just as a mother, say, has put their, their son or daughter, their child into a crib, and this can be a father as well, and uh, say you don't live in a place with air conditioning, and you don't live in a place, you live in a place where there is, are a lot of mosquitoes or flies, you just, a parent, a loving parent would just gently, uh, they're paying attention to the whole area around the body, around the body of their baby. And if a fly or a mosquito comes up, then they can just gently, you know, it doesn't have to take that much effort to um, brush away a fly. And so similarly, we can pay attention to this full inner sense of the body and something comes up, say, we start thinking about, uh, say, if we're in meditation and thoughts start coming up about planning what I'm going to do tonight or what happened earlier today or planning what I'm going to say to this guy next time I see him, then if I'm trying to meditate, then that is a fly, that is a mosquito, and I can just gently, okay, brush it away, brush it away. And uh, if we catch these things uh, soon enough, and it's as if the mosquito never lands on the baby. And it doesn't really take much energy at all to just, it's just air, uh, you know, pushing the fly away. You don't even have to contact uh, the insect themselves. Um, so that's the second simile, simile of a uh, parent just gently fanning their child, paying attention to the whole body of the child in the crib, and just fanning away any Thing that comes to disturb the, the sleeping child. Next simile, it's one which the Buddha gave. Um, it's a simile for mindfulness in general being the gatekeeper. So we can conceive of mindfulness uh, as being someone on a tower, say a castle tower. This is the image that the Buddha gives. There's a castle that's surrounded by a rampart, and there's a gate that enters the city. And we have a uh, gatekeeper who's basically watching over that whole gate and it's not like the gatekeeper is staring just you know one foot in front of that door awaiting for you know some trespasser or some enemy to barge in or for some you know messenger to come in they're, they're they have a broad view they're looking at the whole path leading up to the gate and in the same way uh, this mindfulness can know the whole body uh, and pay attention and know and see from afar, actually, um, is this person that's coming? Are they a friend? Are they a foe? Um, is, it, is it a person at all? Is it a, a wild beast? Is it a, a weather pattern? You know, what's, what's going on? Is it a tornado? The person in this tower, the gatekeeper, sees all of this. And in the same way, we're paying attention. If we let the mind stay big, paying attention to the whole path leading up to the gate, then when things come up, we can take appropriate measures. If angry thoughts start coming up and we don't want to uh, nurture those and don't want to become an angry person who's just habitually uh, irritable, then we can take steps and say, apply loving kindness. Yeah, so uh, these angry thoughts come up and we yell out to the angry visitor who's rushing our gate, chill out, friend, no enemies here, you know, basically, just whatever it takes, whatever skillful means you have to, uh, and each person, each gatekeeper, you have to figure out, one, you have, you have to become sensitive to the different uh, typical guests coming into the castle, um, become familiar with them, and know their tendencies, know the tendencies of um, irritability or righteous indignation or uh, craving and obsession. You label these and you get to know them better and you know how to respond to them when they come to the gate, when you feel them in the body. Because many of these mental uh, afflictions or even our, our mental friends, those things which we want to let into the, uh, let into the, the city, into the fortress, like loving kindness, you can let uh, a sense of metta or compassion or softness just imbue, let that into the city, let that into your awareness of the full body. 
just let that, uh, um, yeah, have its effect on you. If it's something wholesome, uh, and the unwholesome things, you don't let those in. Um, but not in a mean way, necessarily. Or actually, you know, it's probably never a nice thing to be totally mean to your any anything that's that's coming up. And so that's the simile that the Buddha gave. And just another, um, say, addition to that simile is oftentimes in, you know, say a real fortress, it wouldn't just be one gatekeeper. You might even have two gatekeepers in the same tower who are basically they're both keeping watch. If you're keeping watch all night, it's not, a, it's not an easy thing to stay up all night. So you might even have a second gatekeeper both to watch out as well and to watch out for that first watchman in case they start falling asleep. So this is analogous to when one's scope of mindfulness is one, if one is taking the whole body as one's meditation object, then it's natural that the aperture of the mind starts to shrink. It's like you've got a broken aperture on your camera and it just slowly uh, gets smaller and smaller. Uh, it di um, and you have this, you can have this uh, second watchman to actually make the mind bigger to uh, wake that first watchman up. So that's one way to uh, another simile. That's our third simile. And the fourth simile is similar, but a bit more natural. So rather than um, a gatekeeper, let's say we have a fire watchman. So you've got, uh, yeah, in some of these national parks, you have someone whose whole job it is is to stay up in a fire watchtower, which are you know, built four, five, six, seven, eight stories up into the air. And you have someone who basically lives up there and is watching, you know, a 360 degree view um, of looking for, for fires. And this is another simile for the mind that can know the whole body, this vast view. And yeah, when you see smoke in the distance, uh, you want to be the type of wise uh, fire watcher who says, okay, is that someone's just campfire? Is that actually not fire? It's just steam? Um, or is this actually, no, that, that shouldn't be there. There are no campers in that place. That's actual forest fire. I need to sound the alarms. Or actually go out and put the fire out. Um, so we keep awareness big and we address, we sound the alarm when it needs to be sounded. Uh, but for the most part, our whole job is just to, to watch and keep our uh, our vision uh, surround, we keep it um, looking in the full 360 or even you know, globally looking in every direction. So with all of these similes, we, we want to be uh, skillful. We want to know the exact right amount of touch uh, to do. You know, we want to, the spider should be a, a wise spider and you know, knows when something is just the touch of air or knows if it's a larger spider that they just don't have any business uh, messing with, in which case the wise strategy might just be to back off. Uh, the parent, you know, if the child's asleep, you can't be too aggressive with your, uh, your waves or else you'll wake the child up. Um, if the enemy horde is just uh, absolutely overrunning your um, tower, and some other kind of measures might be needed. I'm not sure exactly what that's a, a metaphor for, but um, there probably are instances um, where everything is just too much. Um, and similarly, uh, yeah, you need to be skillful about how much um, how much you respond and how you respond to the the fires that you that the um, fire watchman notices, fire watch person notices. So. On the uh, extreme ends of the feelings, so this is all about how, this is all about staving off ignorance and staying with feeling before going to craving. Craving is when, uh, yeah, craving is when you basically smack the baby with your fan or it's when the uh, watchman just lets um, anybody into their city 
or it's when the uh, fire watch person just totally uh, lets everything burn to the ground. That's that's craving and the steps that lead up to um, craving and attachment. But on both sides, like things which are either uh, just very minor or very major, like extreme feelings of um, dukkha and sukha. There's another approach, which I might go into in more depth next week, which is an approach called RAIN, R-A-I-N, which is an acronym for recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture. So I don't think we'll have so much time, uh, unfortunately, to go into this method, but this is um, what we do when things are just too much. Yeah, when uh, the animal that's broken the spider's web is just too large, when our dukkha is just too overwhelming, or even when we're just fully in the midst of um, about of any of the hindrances, and everything else we try to do just doesn't work. We've got some intense craving, intense obsessive uh, thoughts which are coming up. And we're just totally overrun. We've tried everything we can. Um, we've tried to uh, just think of something else. We've tried to ignore them. We've tried to think of the drawbacks. And we've tried to relax ourselves. Um, and we've just tried to forcibly annihilate um, these oppressive and obsessive thoughts. Um, but sometimes we need to have this other tool, which is, is the rain where you just recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture. And this allowance is quite uh, profound because one finds that uh, although we really want in these cases, when I mean, this is the right tool, uh, fully allowing, fully uh, just this is how it is, this is the way things are, and just watching that, investigating it, and being nurturing with that. Uh, that's the right response. And if we were to do anything else, our doing can just make things worse. This is, uh, these are those obstreperous uh, hindrances, which it seems the more we do, the more they buck back. It's like a child with, uh, I think it's called um, uh, defiant, resistive syndrome or something like this, uh, where basically the more rules or the more you try to uh, address their behavior, then the worse they get and the more they act out. So with those type of, um, yeah, with those type of flies coming into our web, with those type of uh, disturbances to the child, with those type of uh, beings at the gate or fires in the forest, rain can be the right, the right method, just uh, recognizing that, allowing that, investigating and nurturing it. So maybe just uh, close there for the time being and open things up to questions. So people can put questions in the, um, in the chat box. And fortunately, people have noted that there's choppy audio it's unfortunate. Okay, let's see if this works any better. Okay, so these similes are very helpful. The example of the spider is resonating with me, especially. Yeah, having uh, particular images uh, can be great for, um, yeah, allowing the practice to uh, really stay alive. Um, when you've got this clear image in, when one has one, this clear image in one's mind, then yes, knowing the full web audio is better. 
Ajahn, what role do you see the Brahma Viharas having independent origination? In my practice, it seems uh, equanimity plays a large role in not having craving arise. Um, well, certainly equanimity can play, as you're noting, um, that can be a really wise response as well to um, feeling, basically. So what you're pointing to is this this nexus, this uh, connection between the, the pariyati, the study, the, the philosophy, the theory of uh, dependent origination, and the, the practice of what we actually do with this information. So based on a feeling, whether it's uh, a lot of dukkha or a lot of sukha, if there's a lot of pain or a lot of um, uh, pleasant feeling, um, what we don't want to do is just go to craving, but rather to stay with equanimity. So this is really at the heart um, for people who have done Goenka retreats. This role of equanimity will be very familiar um, in that that's basically uh, the method that uh, Goenka suggests is with his method, you're scanning the body from the top of the head to the bottom rather than just knowing the whole thing at once. Um, but as you're scanning, you are remaining equanimous with each and every different sensation uh, pleasant, painful, or neutral that arises. So that's equanimity. Um, but similarly, with the other Brahma Viharas, those can be uh, proper responses to other types of um, feeling. So from basically using the Brahma Viharas as a uh, response to feeling so that it doesn't lead to craving, a response to Vedana, so it doesn't lead to Tanha. So in the Chula Vedala Sutta, um, the Buddha talks about how the underlying uh, root of uh, the pleasant is um, the under is uh, craving or desire. Um, so, and the underlying uh, root, the underlying principle of uh, dukkha is. Um, uh, disliking. So from that, we can respond when there is dukkha, uh, that can be a time to practice. Um, that can be a prime time to practice metta, because oftentimes, in response to uh, the unpleasant, we respond with um, aversion and irritation and pushing away. So if we bring metta to that, if we bring metta, both to the thoughts, which are coming from that uh, dukkha, vedana, that uh, unpleasant sensation um, to the to the feelings and to the thoughts, applying metta to the thoughts that come from that, then that's where uh, that can lead to a non-arising of craving, but to equanimity instead, and for us to just stay with um, stay with the feeling. So, um, yeah, I hope that makes sense. I think it's a great question um, and just one to keep uh, experimenting with. Um, yeah, see how you can bring how meta can lead to uh, non-craving, basically, to non-arising of um, uh, desire. John, thoughts on the advantages and disadvantages of just brushing away adventitious thoughts during meditation versus noting them. Yeah, so um, maybe I wasn't as explicit um, as I would hope to be, but I think you point to um, a very wise consideration, is that for the most part, the spider and the parent and the gatekeeper and the fire watch person all they have to do for most of the time is just watch. Yeah, there aren't, for most of the time, there's not insects jumping into the web. There aren't necessarily flies coming to bite our children. Uh, there aren't enemies at the gate or fires in the wilderness. Uh, we just watch. We're just noting. We're just knowing. And that's the simile of the body. So this can, this can be a place of rest. So... Um, yeah, rather than constantly 
brushing or constantly responding to nothing at the gate. We can just rest and just watch, just keep our eyes open. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, hopefully that can more and more be our, um, our pivot spot, the place where we just stand in our meditation. Um, yeah, and noting is certainly one way to just keep the, keep the eyes open, one way to just, yeah, um, no need to brush away. I'm just knowing the whole body and there are no like intense or even say minor uh, pleasant feelings urging me to desire or unpleasant feelings urging me to uh, push away. So yeah, good, good question. Ajahn, is gratitude different from mudita? I've heard the term appreciation used in the Rahula Sutta instead of joy. Is that different from gratitude? Um, I'm not sure which Rahula Sutta you're referring to. There is the Chula Rahula Vada Sutta, which I think is Manjima's uh, um, 61 or 2, um, where the Buddha recommends that uh, Rahula practice mudita as an antidote towards arati, and arati means um, uh, dislike or um, irritation. Um, so I think whoever did the, that translation of appreciation, I think that um, makes sense there because you know using. Um, so I'm going to have to look at this, this sutta. Um, but is gratitude different from mudita? Um, one thing to note is that mudita and pamoja and uh, pamojati, these different Pali words all have this, um, well, those three have the root mud, which just means soft. Yeah, so mudu, uh, you, the Buddha, in, at least in the, in the Abhidhamma, there's talk about um, in every wholesome mind moment, there is uh, mudu chitta and mudu kaya, kaya mudita, chitta mudita. So there is um, softness of body and softness of mind in every wholesome mind's mind moment. That would include gratitude. Um, the Pali word for gratitude is katanyu. So kata, that which has been done on you, knowing. So it's knowing that which has been done for us, a knowledge of uh, a knowledge of thanks, a knowledge recognizing that we have things to be, be thankful for. And I think that does, that is certainly a wholesome mind moment. So it would have this, this softness, this softness of body and softness of mind that come along with every wholesome mind moment. Um, mudita is generally spoken of in reference to others. So uh, taking joy in other people's joy um, but it also does appear just in context, like the Buddha says, that a monk should uh, resort to a cave or to an empty hut and practice uh, infinite mudita meditation. So there, one is not necessarily you know, seeing other people do nice things for them and reflecting on that, but just perhaps uh, reflecting on this joyful well-wishing of, of others' joy. Um, whereas gratitude in English usually does, um, it's, it's actually quite similar to, um, uh, the Pali, but actually I've thought that the word appreciation is a good translation for gratitude in Pali because this Pali word katanyu, knowing that which has been done, uh, gratitude covers like the gift giving aspect of that. I know and I recognize and I realize that this person has helped me and I'm grateful for that. I have katanyu for that. But the word appreciation both covers this, I realize what um, you've done for me. And it also covers appreciation of karma. So kata, which is related to karma, that which has been done, it's a past participle, 
on you, knowing that which had been done, appreciating the past, appreciating all the gifts, appreciating all the karmic causes which have influenced this present moment. So I actually think appreciation is a better term for uh, katanyu than is gratitude. Um, but I don't think it's a very good translation for mudita. So thank you for everyone else who was able to stick with that rather um, Pali-ish explanation. So I, um, we have a little bit more time for a question or two, but just uh, urging everyone to experiment with this. Um, Bhante Analio, uh, Ajahn Jeff, Ajahn Jayasaro all recommend and praise this taking of the whole body as one's daily meditation object through what is daily life. Uh, daily life is... Uh, living with as big a mind embodied as, as possible. And this isn't the only uh, definition of mindfulness, um, but it is uh, one very clear, very well within the Buddha's uh, definition of mindfulness. Um, it is one way of practicing mindfulness, which is very, uh, both very tangible. You can realize when you have, uh, when the mind is getting smaller and moving away from uh, this bigger appreciation. And it also allows us to um, do course correction when there is uh, craving or irritation and aversion on the horizon. Uh, when we're feeling the whole body, then we can more easily and quickly recognize when the bodily tensions which are associated with uh, afflictive mind states arise. So by paying attention to the whole body, in a sense, we're paying attention to uh, the whole mind and then can affect the body through um, movements of the mind, relaxations of, of the body. Um, so yeah, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, we will just a moment transition over to our Zoom room. So uh, usually after these YouTube talks, we go to Zoom and have a interactive conversation where people can express their thoughts and talk about um, what's going on in their own practices and um, just sharing. It's a really lovely time. And that link is on the in the Clear Mountain Monastery website. You just go to www.clearmountainmonastery.org and then go to the calendar and find today's date and then just go to the Zoom room. And in addition to that, uh, we will be back. Ajahn Isbo teaches every week live um, at uh, St. Mark's Cathedral. Um, and we'll be back again next week for more talk about uh, dependent origination. So I uh, appreciate everyone who's come and I yeah, wish everybody a wonderful soft mind and soft body, as Sarah Conover says. So take care, everyone.